Hello, today we have an expert analytical club on the burning topic of the migration crisis on the border between Belarus and the European Union. I would like to remind you that we're recording the discussion. Burden will be available on the Press Club's YouTube channel. Incidentally, those who will watch our discussion on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so as not to miss our new videos. And our speakers today include Nasta Loika, human rights activist from uh, Human Constanta, Vitis Yurkonis, lecturer at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University, head of the Freedom House Office in Lithuania, Kamil Klesinski, uh, who is a senior analyst at the Center of for Oriental Studies in Warsaw, and Zmitir Mitskevich, analyst of Belarus Security Blog Project and host of Belsat TV channel. Now I'll give the floor to the moderator of today's discussion, Vadim Majeka. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Anton, and thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Indeed, the topic that we will be discussing today is long overdue because for a long time, the migration crisis has been with us. There are a lot of mm, arguments about that. Many people blame each other. People come up with different ways and proposals of getting out of this crisis. Among our speakers today, there are people who will tell us more about that. This shows as this topic is very controversial and important. We constantly get information about new records. To date, 667 people who wanted to illegally cross the Belarusian Polish border, according to the Polish authorities. Today, we'll try to not just find, not to give tags, who's good, who's bad, we'll try to understand what is happening, how, who is coping with the situation. We'll try to find the balance between the interests of all those parties involved, and we'll see what it will all lead to. But probably It will probably not end today or tomorrow. We'll try to view this problem from different angles. We have different speakers today. Hopefully we'll hear different opinions about what is happening. As Anton already said, we work according to the Chatham House rules. So if he wants not to be quoted, please let us know beforehand. Let's so we'll start with our first question. How successful yeah, the Western neighbors of Belarus are coping with the migration crisis? Everybody has their own success criteria. Some say it's number of people they received. Others believe it's the height of the fence. So it's up to the speakers to decide. We'll move in the same order as we introduced our guests. We'll start with Nasta Loika. We'll hear the opinion of the human rights activists. Then we'll hear opinions from the Lithuania and Poland about how much this crisis became a problem for them. And uh, then we'll move to Dmitry Matskevich. Nasta, please, the floor is yours. We have two, three working languages, Russian, Belarusian, and, La and English. Each speaker decides for themselves. Thank you, Vadim. I think I'll try using Russian. Do we have any limitation in terms of time, time frame, something like that? We all have such limitation. Hopefully, we'll have about seven, eight minutes each, including the Q&A. We're expecting uh, more questions to come in the Zoom chat. Thanks. Right, I'll deal with uh, human right protection. I've been working with the migrants since 2014. Since then, we've seen a lot of different things. We worked with the uh, transit migrants in 2016. 
when Poland did not let the migrants in. As I understand, we'll be uh, discussing the situation that started in summer of this year. While getting ready for this event, I already said that I don't like the term the migration crisis because indeed there are some challenges, but a crisis is something more significant, more serious. I tend to view this situation as a challenge that uh, both the state and the civil society needs to tackle to understand what to do with it. Everybody calls it the migration crisis, a hybrid attack, our big loud words. I think this is manipulation. I'm particularly worried what we deal with as an organization. We're trying to bring in the human factor. We're trying to ask people to see that there are people in the border that need to be helped. And it's important to consider the um, interest of the state, but we also need to consider the interest of the people. We believe that very often the media outlets and describe all these events from the point of view number of people found discovered at the border in a similar sense that they describe the number of cigarettes smuggled at the border. But these are living people. They starve at the border. They die at the border. They're not let in. That we're trying to bring in the to focus on the human factor. Unfortunately, in the last several months, we did a all we could not to use the term illegal migrant because if they do get inside the country without the papers breaking the procedures but uh, turn for legal protection it means that did not break anything and also this term is very discriminating we need to consider this we spoke a lot with the bills and media outlets about this we also work with international organizations. Some media outlets are ready to and to work in, in these lines. Others continue to describe it in the same way. So the question was, are we who is coping with this situation? We've seen different ways of approaching the issues. Today we'll hear people from Lithuania and Poland. We know that Finland and Estonia sometimes suffer from that when people get to them. A lot of people, about 8,000 people, already tried to get inside the Lithuania. Some tried to get into Latvia. So 15,000 people it is a problem. But I saw the statistics that about 300,000 people living for these countries from Belarus through the official border crossing points. I believe there is no big difference from people running from Belarus of those running from Iran, Afghanistan. There are none, there are none of them. That's the equality principle from the point of view of human rights. Some actions by the state, I like them. A big part of the actions were connected with Iraq and Lithuania acted in an interesting way towards them. The Belarusian border officers did not always cope with this influx and Belarus has been using the pressure mechanism. But all these bad mouthing of people in the media outlets is not the best approach taken by the state. The fact that Poland is officially pushing them back to Belarus is, uh, I think, breaking the international law 
and the Polish legislation that re was recently amended. I um, uh, mean the Convention on uh, Migrant and Refugee Status. I'm worried about that because we cannot do much in Belarus. I cannot come to the neutral territory and will not, I will not get access to the people. Overall, I know that mass media are not allowed to talk with people kept there. So we cannot always understand the, what the real problem is. So I believe we should have involved more different actors, including more international organizations from different sides. In this way, the problem will be solved more actively and effectively. So instead of building walls, this could have been an alternative approach. Thank you, Nasta. I uh, did expect to hear your opinion about that, and we heard it. Indeed, we have the humanitarian dimension that should not be ignored. On the other hand, there are other opinions about that. So I would like to give floor to Vitis Yurkonis, representative of Lithuania, the first country from our Western neighbors of that had to deal with the influx of migrants. Would you think it is how successful has been as the thing been coping with this? First and foremost, I agree with uh, what Nasta said. I would not call this a crisis. This is a tension, this is a challenge, but it's not as big as a crisis at least the crisis that we saw five or six years ago in other countries of Europe, but definitely not a crisis in that sense of the word. If we can say the number of people that, that arrived in Lithuania, we can compare it with the number of Belarusians who have moved to Lithuania of, there were more of them. So Lithuania needs to cope with such a flow. It, it is capable of doing that. But the problem, if we compare this with the Belarusian situation, the, there are few possibilities for the Lithuanian authorities and migration authorities to understand who is coming in Lithuania, considering that very few of them have papers on them, very few of them speak the languages that our border officers speak and migration officers speak. We don't know much about the Middle Eastern region where they come from, or Africa. We don't know much about their problems and their issues. We don't, we're not in contact in, with the human rights activists from that region, from those regions. It is all solvable, even though it is more difficult to do. I also don't like to, the names like hybrid attack there was like hybrid attack because it means that it's some kind of a war in this regard it is used not uh, it is a way a war which not using weapons but using people and when body must who were the victims the victims are these people that are basically were ambushed who's to blame i understand I see, clearly see who's to blame. It is the side who invited them, who gave them visas. So they were tricked. They were promised something that should not have been promised to them. And they got into a trap. How do I assess the situation, what I think of the situation that Lithuania is not letting them in. I believe this was uh, actually approved by the European partners. It is understand understandable because for the majority of these migrants, the end point 
is not Lithuania. There's the end goal is another country. They're planning to use Lithuania as a transit country. They're planning to reach Germany or Sweden, some other country. Lithuania is not only protecting their own border, but also the border of the European Union in this case. So the question here is how Lithuania, Poland and Lithu Latvia are responsible as players of the whole Schengen system, of Schengen border system. So despite the fact that the hybrid attack as a term is not the best, but if we look at it as the purposeful policy of Minsk, this is definitely it. I don't, I don't think there's much to argue about here. Nasta and human constructor have, have been dealing with the migrants and their rights. These issues and the approach to migrants left much to be desired in the Belarus in the past. It is very easy. And this is an issue to discuss with the human rights activists of Belarus and other countries. It is, of course, you can you can come to Warsaw, Vilnius and Riga that you did it in the wrong way. It's breaking the international law and so on and so forth. Let's improve the conditions. And of course, something can be amended. But the question is, what do we do with the authoritarian countries? What do we do with the torture in Belarus? But what are the CSTO, the Red Cross, doing about that? When you talk with them about the repression in Belarus, they say that we cannot be harsh on that on them because the, we need to be inside the country. And the I issue at hand is clear. It's obvious who is inviting the migrants, who is transferring them into the ambush. So far, the, the, the issue of strengthening the staff and so, of international organizations who could help the human rights activists in Belarus who are still there to deal with the situation. I understand that they used to help the Chechens who wanted to cross the Schengen border, crossing to Poland. And then uh, when the Chechen issue was uh, really uh, an issue, was a big issue, we see a connection. We see a narrative of Lithuanian authorities saying that, what if you came from Iraq or, or Africa, Sudan, Syria? Are you safe in Belarus? Is it a safe country for you or not? Basically, it's not a safe country for Belarusian citizens but for for citizens of Chechnya, citizens of Russia, it's also not particularly safe because we know that the, there were people who were kidnapped. But uh, what about the Middle Easterners? And uh, according to the international law, of course, each person has a right to turn for asylum, to ask for asylum. But the question is, why not do it in Belarus? Where does this border end? Where the person will be happy to ask for asylum? You probably know that the Schengen system, there is a Dublin right. Let's uh, imagine that a person from Iraq reaches Berlin and asks for asylum there. Basically, he needs, according to the Dublin agreement, he needs to be transferred to Lithuania and Poland, where he crossed the border. 
So I believe a lot of work needs to be done here by human rights activists to raise awareness about that, about how people are get protected by the international law, who protects them. We hear about that in Vilnius, Warsaw, and uh, Vilnius. We need to reevaluate, reassess the migration policy, rethink the migration policy because this because of this gray zone misused. I think the migration policy will uh, get tougher, meaning that the people become more vulnerable. It also shows how much the totalitarian countries are using the uh, benefits of the international system of uh, democracy and they're doing everything they can to kill it. I think I will leave the left the, the rest for the Q and A session for the discussion. Also, we need to understand that in the last decade or so, the asylum cases were um, there were several hundreds of them per annum without the the Belarusians who are, want to get the national visas uh, citizen permits would get actually would uh, suffer because of that crisis the same is true uh, about the hospitals during the COVID times and vaccinations. There is a line where the system can simply collapse. And this pushback issue uh, is a must, otherwise the system would collapse. This is not a, the best decision there is, but uh, and some things need to be corrected and discussed, amended. But eventually, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, this challenge and the repercussions of the problem. And they are connected with the Lukashenko regime. That uh, is uh, not re uh, is not held responsible by either its citizens or the international law. It needs to be changed. Yesterday was the Astagets nuclear power station that was built uh, without proper rules. And today it's migration crisis. Tomorrow it will be something else. Thank you. Okay, Vilis, I like your metaphor about the COVID hospital and that it's not always a choice between good and bad decisions. Sometimes it's a choice between two bad decisions. In this case, I would like to give floor to Camille. Uh, I will not repeat the question. Well, it's, uh, I have to answer the same question. It's very difficult for me to add something because our views on the situation of Poland, Lithuania are very similar. I'll try to add something and tell what we do in the, our research center. We try to understand what the official Minsk does and how it perceives us. Poland, Lithuania, and how they do this, and why they do this. I think uh, they have a similar approach and common approach with the Russian side. We should not forget about that because this operation is not part of the typical pressure instrument used by Russia. In the past, Russia used it towards Norway and sometimes Syria. Going back to the reconstruction of the way of thinking that people in Belarus have, they started this oppression together with the Russian counterparts. They perceive us, Poland, Lithuania, and other countries of the European Union as uh, some complicated organisms that uh, have a lot of discussion connected with that. But this dis discussion is needed because uh, by pushing migrants to us, they fuel our discussion uh, that is done and held by our NGOs, of whom there are a lot. 
our legal human rights activists are doing this, protecting the migrants, particularly children, women who are suffering from the from the so-called crisis. If you don't like the term crisis, and I can call it an issue, a problem. Um, they perceive us as a country or as countries where um, regular parliaments work, not the, the parliaments used to rubber stamp the decisions of the top authorities where we have an outside the regular discussion with the government that is not there for good, where there is political struggle. So this crisis uh, is actually was thought out to tackle all these vulnerabilities of the democratic system. They believe our system are not perfect and uh, uh, could be subject to provocations. They are constantly checking our sustainability, our stability, uh, response, how long it takes us to take this or that decision, how successful this or that decision will be. I agree with law, uh, with human rights lawyers and uh, activists that we should not view the people, the migrants, uh, similar to packs of cigarettes or trucks full of cigarettes. Of course, we know that these are people who are and they're alive. In Latvia, where the pressure is not that high and must shift into Finland, they are similar to us in thinking that we and it is to stop this dehumanization of people, the migrants by the Belarusian authorities. In the framework of the game that I described to you, we need to perceive it in this very way. And not in the sense that the Polish authorities are stumbling trying to put more pressure on, on these people, making them suffer even more. This is not the case. This is just a struggle with the cynical game of Alexander Lukashenko. That is why the, we at the eastern border of Poland, we uh, introduced the emergency state. It was done also to uh, I mean, the state of emergency to bring down the media effect that uh, author Belarusian authorities want to achieve by using propaganda. Of course, uh, we need to consider the suffering of people, but we need also to understand that we are trying to block the attempts of the Belarusian and Russian authorities to further dehumanize migrants. That, that's basically it for me. Thank you, Camille. Well, we have heard many different views on the same issue. I give floor to Smitir. Basically, I'm switching to the Belsat studio. Good afternoon. Uh, we're not in the studio, we're in the Belsat newsroom. This is where I am now. How do you think uh, successful the attempts of coping with the crisis? If we talk about uh, how successful it is, we should use the criteria that are stipulated and built in and the legislation of the countries. So we put it in the uh, framework of values. We could argue forever what's good and what, what's bad. The border control was created in order to safeguard the border and uh, prevent people from illegally crossing it. The people working there 
receive money for that. So if they are coping with protecting the border, they're good at their job. We can then discuss the methods of doing that, of reaching this goal. But the main criteria also uh, laid out in legislation is uh, how to protect the border. It's uh, not very easy to add to what has been said today, but the, so far this, we've had a situation where uh, it's not going to end in a day or two in the near future. A few, several points are important to focus on. As Camille said, we need to understand what motivates Minsk in this and what tasks they're setting, what goals they're setting before them. I made a lot of stories about that. According to information I possess, this operation is conducted with the support of Russia. The first flows of migrants were helped to recruit by Russia. This scheme was launched in 2010, was used earlier. The Russian FSB was actively involved in recruiting migrants. It was done not in the, uh, abroad, but in Moscow. So they didn't have to go very far for that. The Polish border guards have already presented the uh, uh, information about that at the press con conference, whether they pre presented documented evidence of this connection with Moscow. This operation was uh, actually thought out and uh, by Mr. Tertil with his friends that he met during his uh, his studies at the FSB in Russia. So here we deal uh, with the hybrid operation. I think it fits very well. We see the direct, the clear pressure. At first, the task was to provoke a crisis. And then when, when they saw that uh, a big crisis is not, will, will not be achieved, if we look at the timeline of the events, we'll see that it was the beginning of the crisis that started in Lithuania. Lithuania was chosen to provoke the crisis so that the big number of migrants could undermine the system of relatively small Lithuania. The Lithuanian colleague, which is spoke about the relatively small number of migrants that Lithuania used to except so it was aimed at undermining that call the system when they saw that the response was quick they switched to different goals and started to actually work with the polish direction again it was done with the help of their allies in kremlin they tried to actively promote and push the illegal migrants towards poland again to split to do the split knowing that in poland the political struggle is quite tough and active and knowing that um, political opponents could use various ways of getting advantage over their adversaries that was the reason why they used these tactics we see that diff in poland there are different approaches different views on what was what is happening But uh, the uh, agents of Lukashenko's regime underestimated the situation, saying that this would undermine, this would provoke the serious split in the Western countries and could lead to a big crisis and could lead to the desire to sit in the, at a negotiated table with Lukashenko. These plans failed. And uh, for now, Lukashenko doesn't have a long-term strategy. But the fact, uh, that they will do it again. I think this is a fact. We need to, again, get back to the ethical categories instead of the categories of security. This is actually the main task of Lukashenko to achieve this so that people would stop think, talking about the issues and ways of 
tackling them and they would switch from the reasons why the migrants came there some from the root of this problem so that they were switching to the ethical issues that the poor migrants are suffering at the border uh, that we should accept all of them so a turmoil starts that will lead to the bad results again we see that this plan did not work we see that um, from the western europe poland lithuania receives si receive signals that they should push on with their stance should not then should not say that we should accept everyone because in the western europe it would the colleagues and counterparts would not understand how to deal with other countries it's now there's an understanding that the migration policy needs to be streamlined and i believe that western europe is not ready to soften this policy as was already mentioned uh, the this conflict will not uh, crisis will not end in the short term but definitely Lukashenko will show that this is a fully fledged crisis. The migrants are suffering from cold. Somebody will die. Many experts uh, believe that the Lukashenko will need this uh, sacral victims at the border that uh, the Belarusian propaganda will show and broadcast about them, trying to um, put pressure on the political establishment on the Western countries aiming at destabilizing the political situation in Lithuania and Poland, Poland to be the major target. Thank you, Zmitir. I did feel that Anasta would like to reply to what Zmitir said. Let's um, discuss the following. The people criticizing the migrants understand that um, building a 10 meter fence would not be the decision that will solve everything. And also putting the transfers to Germany at the border, Poland Lithuania, is not a solution. We need to find the balance. I would really like now to discuss how this balance could be found what it would be and how to achieve it. Nasta, please. Thank you very much. I don't really remember using the term ethical that much. I uh, used the, uh, the term legal because the legal norms say that the Poland, Poland and Lithuania must uh, view these cases from a legal point of view. But the balance is also important because people have various rights we're talking about the, the rights for migration and, and the right to turn for international protection. There are various mechanisms for that, let alone other inalienable rights for food, to food and life. Going back to the balance, I want to talk about the picture that I see, but I see it from three different dimensions, in three different dimensions. The first one, is that everything happening at the border when people arrive there they're either prevented from crossing the border pushed back or they're left there that's one of the dimensions that we should consider in also the polish border guards have uh, have to put, transfer these migrants to the migrant centers and view the review their cases so there's a balance of legal norms some limitations in the state of emergency in poland that's one of the dimensions we need we have a foundation here too i understand that this is a problem for the state I'm not particularly worried about that 
because there's a presumption of innocence towards these people. Belarus now is making money on that. They're interested in the numbers of people. I uh, believe that at some point in the future, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia will put fences on the border. But there are still some norms of the EU for migration convention, Lithuanian, Latvian, and Polish laws. There's another dimension, the second one. It is the uh, attempt of the Belarusian authorities to promote this flow of migrants. They're inviting these people, they transfer them to the border and so on. It is a problem. This uh, attempt is nothing new. I mean, if you can see the Belarusian authorities. And the third dimension is where does it come from? I mean, where does it stem from the, the issue? Where are people running from? There are countries in the 21st century where people, the minorities are under pressure, are persecuted. So people are selling all the belongings there and using any opportunity to leave the country. There's another problem. When people run, they run to the countries where the legal mechanisms are not the strongest. They don't know about the Dublin agreements. They probably have never crossed the border of the towns of the cities. They were told that the Poland could be safe for them. They don't know much in, about that in legal terms. I see there's four issues to deal with. Obviously, we're working with the Polish organizations trying to tackle some of the it's difficult to work with the belarusian colleagues because belarusians are the organizers that i think if the polish lithuanian authorities try to uh, negotiate this process with the countries where these the migrants are coming from this could be an effective the problem lies there, first and foremost, when it needs to be considered. If we talk about the legal culture of the people, if I decided uh, to do something about that, I would uh, inform people about that. Because people are paying money that uh, uh, they need to be, they are planning to get back if they're do not cross the border. So there are some mechanism, mechanisms used. There's a wide range of issues that needs to be tackled separately. The balance of security and the human rights. I know that the people are being manipulated. The presumption of uh, innocence of these people is still there. I would consider the human rights aspect, put it, make it more important. The fact that people are not dangerous of the 14,000 people, I, I've never heard any of them belonging to any terrorist organizations. I don't want anything like that to happen, but, but I would like to remind you about the human uh, dimension of the problem. Thank you, Nesta. I agree that the human dimension is important, but the issue remains how to find the balance, how to effectively solve this. What should Lithuania do to tackle the security issues and uh, to keep the humanitarian issue in mind? I'll start from the different end. The question is as follows. Should I, as a citizen of Lithuania, uh, feel guilty about what is happening in Syria, in Sudan, in Belarus, in Iraq, and so on? Basically, as a sensitive person, I uh, should. But where, where is the solution? The solution is 
in the international organizations that need to be effective. And if uh, human rights were observed everywhere, there would not be problems like that and people could live quite peacefully. But the human rights activists and more on the leftist side, when you tell them about the human rights and democracy, they ask him not to get attacked by these values. So it's this or that. So people regularly run away, although in every case it's individual, every case individual, but knowing about hundreds of thousands of cases of Belarusians who came to Lithuania, not all of them are running away from repression. Not each, every of them, each of them has documented proof of uh, the threats and so on. Of course, we understand that person uh, may, get, may get into rep repression if you just walk along the street in Belarus and uh, uh, pay attention to what is happening and people being beaten by the police. I think the crisis is much bigger there. Just see the, just consider the figures, people, number of people live in Belarus for Lithuania. We can see some overlap here. If should should the migrants from other countries be, be considered when the Belarusian authorities are putting their own citizens under pressure? So the big question remains: What do we do that international organizations are more effective that the human rights are? number one priority and not number five and number six when the they meet at the security council they should talk more about not about the geopolitics but also about human rights issues if we talk about the second dimension the regime you know it's it's the same we know who is artificially creating the problem again they're shooting themselves in the foot where the regime thought that we would create problems in the neighboring countries. But as a result, there's a bigger understanding that the, what is happening in Belarus is a threat to regional security, not only to the people inside Belarus. Although some, they managed to achieve some goals, like the shift the attention from, from the internal issue issues in Belarus. For the last three months, we have been paying more attention to the migrant crisis and not about talking about the repression in Belarus that is still happening, including the late, the latest tragedy that took place in Belarus. Third, what can Lithuania do? Incre improve the conditions and rules Indeed, the, the issue is not like about building fence, but also about building infrastructure and camp that actually happened five years ago. But now we need new buildings, new infrastructure can, that cannot be built within a day or two. Also the human resources, you will not be able to learn Swahili in a day or two. We do receive support from the uh, European colleagues, we get more experts, but I, uh, I'm confident that uh, Lithuania will be amending its migration policy. He has been thinking about it in for the last five years. Hopefully, will, due to this or thanks to this challenge, will become even more European as a country. This progress is happening. The discussions at the European level, people, ex we see that the uh, Lithuania and Poland will not be left alone with the crisis. We know that uh, Poland will soon chair the OECE and uh, 
it will actually bring more focus to the to this crisis. First and foremost, we need to solve this issue of uh, Belarusian internal pressure. No, uh, nobody has actually, I mean, the international law is still there and this impunity, this lawlessness in Belarus should be dealt with. Otherwise, we will uh, have more issues. And we don't know who is coming to us, I mean, the migrants. I know several cases when uh, Russian citizens cross the border where they uh, openly uh, told lies about their origins. So who are they? Are they a threat of the Russian democratic diaspora who is growing, which is growing in Lithuania, coming there legally? Because for Belarusians, both Lithuania is both for, for Belarusian and Russian human rights activists is a safe haven sometimes. It is part of the controlled migration process. Nasta knows very well about the flow of citizens from Tajikistan who came and applied for asylum in, in Lithuania, and they did get this, this asylum. But the numbers are staggering now. We need to uh, strengthen the system and infrastructure. I am confident that the will the progress will happen and it's actually what uh, is different between us and authoritarian countries. We need to be more decisive so that there will be no lawlessness like this, but eventually it will lead to problems in Lithuania as well. Thank you, Vidas. Vidas knows which words to use, what words to use. Camille, same question, how to find this balance in Poland. Again, it's difficult to add something. Let's change the question. Well, you, are, you can be more brief than the previous speaker. You don't have to speak for so long. I uh, would like to focus on a very important aspect of this main goal, judging by the statements of the official or semi-official Minsk. The aim of these actions is to get it at the round table of these negotiations and reach a compromise. Well, basically they are saying that let's, let's be friends, like Lukashenko said in the previous press conference. Now let's have the sanctions lifted. For me, it's a disinformation. I don't see any will of the Russian authorities to have a proper discussion and to reach a proper compromise, since if they're using the instruments, if they use such instruments to reach a compromise and to get back the confidence and which basically this is a sign of uh, Belarusian regime born totally inadequate and uh, being uh, totally invalid and inappropriate. I think they also understand that nobody will have negotiations with them in such conditions. Judging by the Poland, by the Polish example, we have a lot of mass media outlets. Some of them are radical. There are, there are a lot of political circles, a, a lot of public organizations. At the same time, some of them are very radical. Some of them are friendly towards Lukashenko. Maybe not that friendly, but in a tolerant way. I may not know everything, but judging by the Polish press and the Polish TV, 
So far, nobody said that or we should have negotiations with Lukashenko. It's only about the attitude to the people at the border. Are the Polish authorities coping with that or not? With this massive influx of migrants, we need to understand that this the rational approach is needed, uh, that negotiations with Lukashenko, the leader of the country, that should not be uh, trusted because he actually acts as an outcast in the Western Europe, in Germany. I may be mistaken, but uh, I believe the European Union is quite uh, as a, is in solidarity about the next package of uh, sanctions. So the new negotiations with Lukashenko are out of the questions. Thank you very much, Thank you, Camille. Dmitry, do you have anything to add about the search for balance? It's an interesting case, as I said. We see and understand that the negotiations with Lukashenko are useless because they will not lead to anything. Since what we all have seen, we have understood that Lukashenko is not a person to negotiate with. Whatever you negotiate on breach with him, come, what, no matter what you agree with him on, he will use this to his uh, advantage. Nasta also mentioned that among the people who arrived, there are no uh, dangerous people, but according to the information from the bipole, I use this information in my stories. Also use the sources of the Polish border guards. Among the people uh, that are put into the territory of Poland, Lithuania by the Lukashenko regime, there are people who are former special forces of the Middle East, also the people who have military background they are selected not by the Lukashenko authorities, but also by the FSB in Russia. When, Lukashenko, when FSB transfers them to the Lukashenko, they say that these migrants must cross the border 100%. So they must penetrate there. And you can do whatever you want with the others. There are evi there's evidence of this. This factor will be used to destabilize the security of the countries. Another important point is that when we talk about the possible solution, as Latvian experience showed, the cooperation, direct cooperation with the countries who uh, or where the migrants originate from. They're important because official Iraq understand that it's not the best approach of disregarding the situation. The, there's no sense in that. There's no advantage either political or economic in that for the authorities of Iraq. There are also states with whom it's difficult to negotiate, like the people who control Syria or Afghanistan. No negotiations could happen with these people. So anyway, if Lukashenko persists in doing what he is doing, I mean, further 
put pressure. And I think it will happen trying to turn this migration crisis into a humanitarian one, blaming all this on the West, saying that the West is letting those migrants die. They'll bring journalists there like Mr. Azarionok, who will put up his tent and use his microphone to broadcast this information 24 seven. I think it will be of certain interest. There will be a certain demand for that in the Belarusian society. So we need to understand that this will continue. Talking about the pressure on Lukashenko in order to stop him, force him to stop this crisis. The balance here is that we should not give in. Lukashenko is wants uh, the other side to talk with him and to give in. It will mean for him that he's doing everything in the right way. He will be totally convinced that this approach works and this is what needs to be done further. We need also to understand that in the past it did work. I mean, this behavior of Lukashenko found some response among the European politicians. It's just it wasn't as crazy as it is now, and the instruments used were not as radical, but the nature was similar or the same. Also, for others, for other countries, uh, this is an example. If where they see Lukashenko succeed, I mean, they will try to do the same. There's a Soviet notion or Soviet uh, expression of the collective West that needs to be dealt with. It will not lead to any constructive solution. We need to be tough on that. We have certain procedures to follow. We are protecting our borders and we will put pressure on Lukashenko using the methods that we have. Again, sanctions or blocking some transport communication, transit, among other things. Because when Lukashenko said that he will stop the transit, that would mean that he would stop it for himself, for Belarus. It will bring some additional cost for the West. But uh, what about Lukashenko? He's left with his logistics hubs. So we, I think when he talk, to talk with Lukashenko in this way, we need to be tough on Lukashenko. Otherwise, people like Lukashenko would not, would not get it. It's impossible to speak with this person at the level of trust, because obviously, there's no trust left, as the experience of the last 27 years showed that he was the head of the country. We have seen that he um, he thought that he could get away with everything. He could emerge unscathed. His actions and the reaction of the Russian Federation confirms that it's rhetoric towards the West they did not find the support with uh, the ally of Mr. Putin. I think it's today's, today's his birthday as well. He's not always happy with Lukashenko's actions. So the pressure on Lukashenko is at the same time pressure on Putin. I think the sanctions and the tough stance are the key that we need to use. We're not without uh, using the extreme measures, this could be the balance. Thank you, Mr. 
Well, I don't think we'll be using our time to congratulate Putin on with his birthday. I suggest we move to the third question today. Let's talk about the prospects, how everything happening today will affect Minsk, where Warsaw will is, will affect not only the state, but also the society. Well, I think we will start with the same order. Master, will this affect us? How it will affect us? Maybe in several years time, we'll have mixed, more mixed marriages and camps at the border. It's difficult to make any forecasts here. Well, basically, I'm not, I don't really understand what a tough stance is. Does it mean that uh, not a single person should be allowed in or, or what? What about the future and the prospect? It's obvious for me that for well, Belarusian authorities, this is very much about two things. First, it's the pressure, creation of challenge for the countries. And secondly, it's about money. Belarus is making money on this. We should not forget about the economic crisis in Belarus and we are existing on the support from Russia. And they're interested in that. They're interested not only in people arriving in Belarus trying to get to to other countries, but also to succeed in that. I think the European countries will find the resources to prevent people from crossing the border, send everyone back to Belarus. I think at some point it will happen. People will find other ways of crossing the border. Obviously, it will not solve the problem, domestic issue in the, the countries of origin. Recently, we analyzed what is happening in Lithuania, which launched the procedure uh, of asking for asylum in the embassy in Minsk. It's an interesting step, but we doubt the effectiveness of this mechanism. It's a nice step, but it's obvious for me. But the, the people, the migrants, will not use this mechanism because they don't know about this. We don't know what it, what it means for them. The, if they are told to go to the border, they will do it. But as a mechanism, as an approach, it's an interesting one. So it's indeed, it's very difficult for me to talk about the prospects. I really hope that there will be some humane attitude to the people at the border that the, their legal rights will be observed. I will agree to what was said, that the Minsk authorities will understand at some point this uh, is not effective and they will stop it, but we need to wait for that. Thank you, Nasta. We follow in the same order. Next is Vitis. In my previous statement, I said that I'm confident that there will be more openness uh, in the civil society, there will be more volunteers. It's happening slowly, but some of my colleagues, including volunteers, are appearing in the camps. But we're still uh developing as a democracy there are more and more trust in the civil society it's good i would like us to move quicker but it is like it is even though it's we're moving slower than we expected but it's still we're more we're moving on it is progress it will be a push for us to amend in some procedures to reassess some possibilities of using embassies or working through embassies. But this is something we can control. 
something that will happen. Even though recently there was a report by an ombudsman working in the parliament, there are some recommendations. There's a room for improvement. And I'm happy to live in a democratic country which has this process. Secondly, the, the authoritarian countries without checks and balances, what to do about them? I said already that we need to be more decisive. We should not turn a blind eye to that. We should demand more action. Belarus is one of the founders of the United Nations organization. It has some obligations, despite it being an authoritarian regime. There is a mechanism of sanctions. They will definitely appear, but there is a, the case of Belarus is a litmus test for the international law and its application in the authoritarian countries. So far, it has not been much of a success, but we'll see what happens next. No conferences are needed. The, we have an example of Belarus, which is not the strongest, the, is not the, the wealthiest authoritarian country, but what is happening inside Belarus is unthinkable. If the international law doesn't affect or doesn't work for such a country like Belarus, what does it mean for countries like Russia, for Putin, for Turkey, for China? So if we cannot do anything about Belarus, just saying, no, there's nothing to do, let's just close down this democratic agenda human rights, etc. not waste our time on that. We should not hold any forums when this Sweden is chairing the OEC and we should not, we cannot affect the elections in Belarus with the documented cases of torture and so on. We can only say that, what, what can we do? While there are institutions in the United Nations working inside Belarus and we're still questioning the duty of Lithuania and Poland to act. What are you doing as international institutions, agencies, the, the head of offices that receive salaries, the, the salaries paid by the taxpayers from all, all over the world? It's their own responsibility. They should not hide behind the, somebody's backs saying that some Brussels, people in Brussels are concerned or worried. What did you do about the situation or did you do to improve the situation with human rights and Belarus? Thank you. Which is indeed it's a very it's a very good question. I mean what did you do to make the situation better? We move on to Kamil. After such statements, it's difficult to add something to what has been said. Uh, so don't ask the collective West to do something to you, for you. Just ask yourself what you did for the collective West. Um, going back to the issue, we need to remember that Belarusian authorities, unlike the Russian authorities and Russian special services, border agencies, etc., including the other uh, institutions do not have uh, any experience of long-term communication with Muslim countries. Russia is a different state. I'm not even talking about the, I'm not even mentioning the uh, Arabic languages, the level of English skills very often leaves much to be desired in Belarus. 
among the Belarusian officials. But Belarusian border guards, unlike the, the Lithuanian and Polish counterparts, did not pass any language tests, at least the one similar to those in the European Union. There are no resources to keep the migrants for longer. And we see that the many people are staying, many migrants are staying in the, at the Belarusian side of the border. Well, they will not be able to cross in bulk in big numbers the, the border very soon. This critical mass will affect the situation in Belarus. It will be another challenge. What to do with these people? We need to remember these people pay their money for this service. They will be disappointed. They will be blaming this on others. What to do with them? This is a question to Lukashenko and his people. What do they say to this? It's an open question. In Poland, we have been actively discussing this among experts. There are proponents of the concept that Lukashenko will continue this pressure in the winter. Hoping to get more dead bodies of migrants in the cold. There are proponents of another concept, including me, that Lukashenko will not have enough resources to keep these people in Belarus further, and he will try to curtail this wave before the winter comes. Still, the issue remains. How long will Lukashenko be able to continue this oppression, even with the support of Moscow? I doubt that this support of Moscow, it is also financial. The experience of the last several years shows that uh, Russia is not ready to pour big resources into this cooperation, and I don't think it will change. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. That's an interesting twist uh, about uh, uh, role of the Eastern migrants in Belarus. I think it, in 2015, the Chinese workers who worked in Belarus built an industrial plant, they marched to Minsk, trying to protest. This doesn't happen very often in Minsk, in Belarus. So we see some street a protest organized by the Middle Eastern migrants, it will be an extraordinary event. Those of you who are watching our video and not seeing the Zoom chat, we'll see what happens. Last but not least, Mr. what prospect do you see for Minsk, Vilnius, Warsaw? What will future bring to us? In terms of Lithuania and Poland, I think it's uh, really hard to add anything new. Everything has been said before me. But as to Belarus, again, we view Belarus in two dimensions. Belarus as a Belarusian people, and we view it as an occupational, occupational regime active in Belarus. I think the representatives will see that the, in their territory there is a there are several thousands of people some say it's up to ten thousand people that they need to deal with further they need to motivate them to get back home and they may not succeed in that because the they don't understand the motivation of the migrants. Secondly, because they don't know about their language very well, as simple as that. And if people remain in Belarus for some time, they may get displeased. 
and unhappy. This disappointment may uh, result in various ways. Let's not forget that Belarusian society is quite conservative. For regular people living in some rural areas and some smaller towns, the presence of these migrants creates tension. People in Minsk are really irritated by them. And in smaller towns, I don't think people, the locals will be happy with that. I think the local bo bodies and agencies of the occupational authorities are not happy about hun hundreds of migrants in the small towns. They need, they need to be controlled. I think anyways, for the authorities, it will be a problem if uh, these people are brought back, it must be done using the money of Belarusian. Again, this shows how far Belarusian regime is planning. To. They have, did not think about this reaction of the West. They did not have the plan B in case their oppression failed. Let's see how fast they come up with it. Anyway, uh, I believe they need to do a lot to try hard. A bigger role will be played by the migrants from Russia. If some of them with, that came from Moscow, I mean, some of them will, they will come back to come back to Moscow, but I don't think there are many of them. We don't have statistics on migrants, unfortunately. It would be nice to have one. It would be nice to see what are the countries there, and what their moods are. We can judge by the TikToks, what is happening. They have funny videos there, actually. I think they're having fun from what I'm seeing. They're singing songs, they enjoy themselves. They don't really understand very well what is what is the future holds to them, where they're heading. Similar behavior is actually shown by the Belarusian authorities, who don't know what the future will bring for them. Anyway, it will lead to a tougher reaction from the West. It will lead to the tougher sanctions, to further isolation of Lukashenko. It's hard to predict what he does next. The social tension will grow. Something will need to be done about that. It's hard to understand what they will do. Maybe they will sit down, think, and decide to organize a similar crisis at the border with Ukraine. Why not? Ukraine is an important trade partner for Lukashenko. And Lukashenko uh, has not been, uh, actually Ukraine has not been really supporting the sanctions that much. Lukashenko might as well you know, to demonstrate the further loyalty to Putin, act in this direction. It might well be that Lukashenko will use these people in some other ways. Again, the migrants don't know where the Poland Ukraine is. I remember uh, outside Petersburg, St. Petersburg once, the, some Russian guy put uh, border pillars. Uh, he brought migrants through them saying that, the, that he took them to Finland and he charged them for that. I think the Lukashenko regime uh, may use the similar tactics or is already using it. It's hard to predict what happened next. Logically, the actions 
there can be many of them. But again, we need to understand the the Belarusian authorities do not often act logically. Obviously, there will be a humanitarian crisis, but will, they will also use the migrants if they uh, face a serious reaction from their side. Thank you, Zmitir. We remembered about the communication channels with migrants. I remember the story about uh, migrants or potential migrants joining or coming into the Facebook group of one of our Facebook partner, of our partners, Belarus Info. Belarus in Focus has a Facebook group used in order by journalists mostly, mostly from the West, Western journalists. We exchange information there. In the, at, at some point, people with, uh, let's say, Nigerian or some Arabic names started to join in this group. A Nigerian posted a document there, a scanned copy, asking if he could uh, use a short-term visa. It was actually an application to get a short-term visa to Belarus. Uh, I brought to him that that I don't know if you can do this, but if you're trying to get the European Union with that, it will be difficult to do because there are people freezing in the, to death in the woods. Well, his answer, he thanked me and then his next post was asking how he can legally get into the European Union. I don't think he knew that the Belarus is part of the European Union or, or not. So, similar message came from Afghani citizen who is now in Iran. He asked us how he can get into Belarus. I uh, wrote to him saying, that, do, do you know that Belarus is not part of the EU? But he said, uh, I'm an Afghani citizen in Iran. I don't know what to do here and anything. Anyway, I didn't know what to say to him. This events. I don't know how this could be done, but I believe the EU may raise awareness and tell people where European Union starts and ends and uh, how you can legally get there. I believe that for a big number of migrants, it is important to learn where this border is and where the European Union is, because at some point the uh, border guards just pushing them and th across the border to Poland so they don't come, don't return. For human rights lawyers and sociologists, you should join this group in Facebook where you can talk directly with migrants. I would like to remind you that you can ask questions in the Zoom in the chat, or raise your hand. Anton is monitoring not only the messages from Afghani refugees, but also your interests in the Zoom. I don't see any questions at the moment. I would like Nasta to comment further. I know that Nasta knows something about the migrants in Kamenets. Maybe she could tell us something interesting about that. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on several things. We have a, a possibility of inf uh, consult people on uh, about the migration issues. Recently, a person from Iraq wrote us saying that his brother was 
near the neutral zone at the border. When we asked him about his personal information, he just stopped the communication. But very often uh, we get such applications. There's a black list of countries in Belarus. People coming from these countries do not get visas to Belarus. I just wanted to add about the actions of Belarus towards these people. I have no doubt that Belarus will solve this issue easily. I started working on this issue in 2014 when we had a hockey championship. It was actively used by uh, people trying to smuggle migrants. They brought them here and said, you know, you need to throw away your passports. Later on, they were found by the migration services. They were put into the detention cells. It was not about 10,000 people then, but uh, I think we I remember there are about 84 people in from Bangladesh in the means detection detention center, about 200 people from different countries. There were a lot of detention centers like that in Belarus. And it's not so difficult to uh, help people um, go back or deport them. I don't think it will be a problem using the resources of the officials. I don't think authorities will allow the people to stay too long in Belarus. Are those migrants from Bangladesh? How do you deport them uh, using their own money? Well, they put actually in the detention center with bad conditions. They interview the person, they ask them about his name, a basic information. They will apply to the embassy, trying to confirm their identity. Uh, meanwhile, people are staying in those detention centers for months. Then they ask for kind of information of the relatives. to ask them for a ticket or for money. At the time, we had a group of our guys working that. We received letters, we received tickets from them, and we brought tickets to the detention center to those migrants. It's a relatively long process, but uh, with new big companies dealing with that, it can be organized much faster. And also, remember, they make lots of money on these people will probably use part of this money to deport them. Let's go back to the story in Kamenets, the town of Kamenets. What happened there? There are some clashes with the locals. No, it's, it's not that much about the tension, uh, but this information that people, are, some migrants are kept there. We don't know how to confirm this, but not far from the border, there are some people, some migrants. We don't know anything about their conditions. But I don't think it'll be probable for the Belarusian authorities to deport them. There are resources, including human resources, for that. Yes, I believe that the Bosnian regime has a lot of repressive tactics. Anton, do you have any Zoom questions? We do have some comments in Zoom. Pa some Pavel from the Green Party. Pavel, do you want to turn on the microphone and tell us something or ask something? Well, 
Ну, вот был комментарий такой от Марии Слепцовой насчет... There was a comment from Marie Slipcova. Last... Uh, about Zmitter's comment uh, that the migrants uh, enjoy themselves in TikTok. He says, she said that, that the Belarusians also enjoyed themselves during the process. It may help them overcome the stress, may have helped them to overcome the stress. Again, I agree that this could help migrants to you know, to overcome this tough conditions. I don't see any more questions. Maybe some, Valery Ivanovich wanted to say something. Good evening, Valery Ivanovich. Glad to see and hear all of you. As to humanitarian side of the problem, these people are unhappy. The people, the migrants who uh, found themselves in this ambush, in this condition. But please note that to fly to Belarus, they paid significant amount of money, several thousands, five, ten, fifteen thousands of US dollars. I don't believe they're totally poor. They sold all their properties, their possessions. From the point of view of a regular Belarusian, these people are not particularly poor and, uh, and disadvantaged. Secondly, yes, the Belarusian authorities using this migrant attack are trying to involve uh, the European Union in so negotiations based on their own agenda. The EU imposed sanctions, demand the uh, release of political prisoners and stopped re to repressions, also demanding the beginning of the internal dialogue. Now, after the Belarusian authorities launched the migration attack, they want to change the agenda. Let's talk, but we'll talk not about the internal political situation inside Belarus, but we'll talk about something else. Let's say we stop the migrant migration attack and you lift in sanctions. This idea seems uh, well developed. It's not so bad and it has logic to it. Besides, they wanted to they were aiming at uh, hoping for a split inside the EU. But actually, they received, they achieved this task because a number of institutions of the EU criticized the actions of Lithuania and Poland. There was a resolution of the Council of Europe on that. The European Court did pass some decisions made some decisions on that. In this sense, there is a, a minimum task that was, goal was achieved. But this attack involved several of those institutions, the border guards, diplomats, propagandists. All this is accompanied by the active and active information attack towards neighboring countries. This is a, an organized strategy. It uh, has emerged today that according to the Polish special services, Belarusians are uh, uh, stopping this campaign they stopped issuing visas. So to say whether it's true or not, because on the one hand, they stopped to issue visas. On the other hand, the number of migrants in the Polish 
border, trying to cross the border, is at its highest. Considering that the fifth set of sanctions is prepared, and since Lukashenko is regularly holding meetings, asking how to balance uh, the harm done by the Western sanctions, it is obvious that the, the Belarusian strategy did not fully work. If I may, I would like to add, according to information from the Polish sources, hello, Vladimir Ivanovich, I'm glad to see you. We met before and uh, we spoke. As to this information, it's not so easy. We need to remember that if Belarusian authorities stop the separation, and I, I believe they will, according to the latest mission, they are already doing this, they will do it slowly in order to uh, keep their face. They will not stop all the flows immediately. And the recent records, the last of all this, this is a, a result of the critical mass appearing in Belarus. There will be no visas, new visas issued, but those already issued will bring enough people. We'll see how it goes. I don't think Belarusian authorities uh, were successful at this. It was a partial success. It's not a fail, failure, but they are thinking what to do next. Thank you. Thank you, Kamini. Thank you, Vary Ivanovich. Indeed, there's a big difference between his uh, psychological satisfaction and the success of the operation. It's much easier to, to achieve the, the former. Do any of our speakers want to add something before we conclude our discussion? If not, I think we should stop here. I know there are people among us who have to be somewhere else. Thank you, everyone, for joining our discussion. We, I think we had a lot of cooperation and mutual understanding today. Hopefully, this way or another, migrants will stay alive. Also, I would like to uh, Anton to tell us about the our next format of discussion that we will start next week. Anton, can you tell us about next discussion where we'll discuss not only the present but also the future? Right, I will inform now the participants. In short, we're launching a project called the, the Dialogue about the Future. It's a number of discussions involving those who are thinking about the future and uh, help us make the foundation for the future today. Lately, we've seen a lot of things happening. Every, almost every week, extraordinary things happen. Things that were left in notice before 2020. We believe it's important to go back or to bring back into the public domain the discussions about the future in order to discuss the concept of the new Belarus and about uh, future society. This dialogue about the future will be launched next week. For now, we are discussing the details with the participants. 
the, the draft topic the oh is the economy the first topic to discuss well, the economy i uh, Uh, left in the chat the address. Nasta is asking if we can talk about the uh, prison reforms. Why not? Anyway, I uh, posted this information in a Facebook group. Uh, there will be uh, information about the future meetings. So I suggest uh, you join this group and uh, receive all the updates. Thank you, Anton. We already said today that Belarusian authorities are trying to shift focus from this migration crisis to the humanitarian issue. So the, the discussion of the future of Belarus is still very important. We'll be doing our best. Is to not to forget about the future, about the reforms. I think many Belarusians have found uh, that it's very important the, to have conditions uh, that will be acceptable for Belarusians. Thank you everyone for being with us today. Thank you everyone for watch this video and we'll see you next time at the meeting of the expert analytical club if you're watching us on youtube please don't forget to like us to comment leave a comment to subscribe to our channel push all the buttons that you can see it will be much easier for us to inform you about our next event thank you everyone for the interesting discussion thank you and goodbye